Hello, everyone, and welcome to the London Machine Learning Meetup. Uh, today, we have Baptiste Rosier, who is a research scientist at Meta, who is going to talk to us about Cold Yama. Uh, the discussion after the talk is going to be moderated by Alex Gu, who is a PhD student at MIT. So, as usual, uh, use the Q&A tool at the bottom to ask your questions. Um, if you would like to ask the question uh, yourself uh, by, like, and speak to the, to the author, then uh, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you. If you need any technical help, please use the chat instead, and I'll try to help you. And as usual, the talk is going to be recorded and it's going to be available on our YouTube channel. So make sure you follow us uh, on YouTube. Uh, just uh, search for London Machine Learning Meetup. And also, don't forget to sign up for the next uh, Meetup, for the, which is going to happen in December. I'm going to share the link uh, in a moment in the chat. So please uh, welcome uh, Baptiste uh, and enjoy the talk. Um, hello, and uh, thank you, uh, Giuseppe, for the introduction. Um, so, I said I'm here to present Code Lama, an open foundation model for code. So, uh, the first question that you may be asking yourself uh, when thinking of uh, foundation models for code is, why uh, would you want to develop models for code in the first place? And the answer, in my opinion, is that uh, you have quite a lot of developers in the world, 28 million. And uh, for us at Meta, we already have tens of thousands. Uh, so if you make all these people just a tiny bit more efficient, uh, basically the impact can be huge. And uh, as we'll see later, you can actually make people more than a tiny bit more efficient uh, using generative models for code. And of course, there are also many more people that want to code and that could use LLM uh, as a tool uh, to help them uh, to learn. And the last thing, uh, which I think is quite important, is that coding actually supports uh, reasoning. Uh, so this example there that you can see is from the PAL paper, where they notice that if they as a model to generate a simple program, instead of generating a solution or instead of doing a chain of thought, it really improves the results on a benchmark such as GSM 8K. And uh, further than that, for natural languages, it's always pretty difficult to test uh, the uh, generations of your model. Uh, like you can, you can do it with a multiple choice question answering, for instance, uh, but it doesn't really test the capability of your model to uh, generate full sequences. Like it's not obvious how to test a model for a poetry generation uh, without humans in the loop, for instance. Uh, but for code, uh, it's much easier because you can use things like unit tests or some pretty objective metrics that can be computed automatically, uh, such as how fast your code is and things like that, uh, to evaluate the uh, how good your generations are. And um, actually, people are already convinced that these models are useful and are already using them or planning to use them. So 70% of uh, professional developers, for instance, are either using or planning to use AI tools. And uh, most of them also have a favorable uh, opinion of these tools. And uh, yeah, most people think that it can increase their productivity, for instance. And then when you look at uh, existing tools in that space, I think that they can be, um, well, broadly categorized as either closed models or open models. Uh, closed models will be uh, barred or the models from OpenAI, for, for instance. So these models run on a GPU on some server, uh, you cannot access the weight and you really interface to the model, really you only interface to the model is uh, this API that uh, you can send some questions to and uh, that will answer. 
Well, for open models, uh, the nice thing is that you can uh, get the weight, uh, which allows you to uh, fine tune these models for your particular use cases, or um, uh, for instance, on your code base. And uh, you can also run it locally uh, without uh, needing to have any internet connection. And everyone in the community can um, contribute to these models and improve them. So uh, Lama and Starcoder are um, open models, for instance. Um, so here, if you, here I'm going to present um, the models that we uh, created for Code Lama. So what we call the family of Code Lama models is uh, basically three types of models: uh, Code Lama, Code Lama Python, and Code Lama Instruct. And um, so the uh, base and uh, Python models are uh, basically designed to be used for code completion, for instance, in an IDE. And the instruct model is designed for uh, code assistant chatbot. For more details on uh, how we train these models, so the base code Lama was trained on 500 billion additional tokens on top of Lama 2. And most of these tokens are uh, related to code. And uh, it supports all the popular programming languages, uh, for instance, Python, C++, JavaScript, or Bash. And um, yeah, a lot more uh, examples of programming languages that it supports. And um, it has a lot of general knowledge about programming. And uh, you can either use it directly, as I said, for completion in an ID, for instance, or uh, for tons of uh, use cases if you fine tune it for your particular use case. So uh, for why we started from Lama 2, uh, the reason is that we found that it's much more efficient. Uh, so basically on this curve there, uh, which shows the perplexity that you can get for code Lama or for a 7B model trained from scratch. Uh, here you can see that you, the uh, blue curve corresponding to code Lama, so starting from Lama 2, is much lower. And uh, actually, if you compare it to the 7B trained from scratch at the end of training, uh, you can see that you get about the same performance at half of the training uh, for code Lama 7B. And and uh, that's even without considering that uh, your learning rate schedule will be more efficient if you uh, set it up to train on only half of the number of tokens. Uh, then uh, from the base model, we also train code Lama Python on, on 100 uh, billion extra tokens that are mostly uh, Python tokens. And uh, yeah, this model is really good at Python code generation. Colama Instruct, as I said before, was actually designed to be used differently. So here, this model can follow instructions uh, like ChatGPT or Lama to Chat. And uh, yeah, basically, you can ask it any question. For instance, how to generate a function, how to update your code to a new version of a library, or how to debug your code. And code Lama Instruct will follow your instructions and answer. So yeah, to sum up these three models, um, they form the uh, family of um, code Lama models. And we call code Lama the base model because it's what really brings the uh, basic capabilities. Uh, but if you want to use it as a chatbot, uh, it's better to use code Lama Instruct that can also follow instructions. And these models come in three sizes, 7 billion, 13 billion, and 34 billion parameters. And uh, models of different sizes can basically be used for the same kinds of tasks, uh, but smaller models are much faster and easier to use. For instance, the uh, 7B model can easily be run on a single GPU and even on a CPU on a laptop if um, it's quantized and can generate answers with very low latency, very quickly. So you may wonder why would you want to use the 
a larger model, such as the 34 billion parameters model. And the answer is that while these models are, uh, well, slower and more cumbersome to use, uh, they're also generally more robust and tend to uh, generate better code. And in terms of speed, if you run on the right uh, type of hardware, uh, the 34B model can still uh, generate code faster than you can read it. Um, so it's not always such a problem for uh, code assistant chatbots. And um, what we've seen a lot of people do is uh, that they start with the smaller models, such as the 7B model, and then they later upgrade to larger models in order to get the uh, best possible performance for their use case. Um, so later here, I'm going to show you some uh, results on some benchmarks and some metrics. Uh, so here I'm going to tell you very roughly how uh, these metrics work. And um, this is an example from Humanival, which is a pretty standard benchmark for uh, code generation. So here you can see that uh, you're given the signature of a function, uh, the def unique, and you know that L is a list. And you're also given a doc string uh, that tells you to return the sorted unique elements in this list plus an example that shows you uh, well how it works on a simple example. Uh, then the model needs to generate the solution, which here is on a single line, but it could be much larger, uh, which is returned sorted of list of set of L here. And um, as I mentioned before, because here we're working on code, um, well, then you, you can actually uh, compile and execute your code uh, once it's generated. And so we use that uh, to actually execute some tests and we check the correctness of the generated code using uh, this unit test. So we consider that it's correct if the unit test pass, basically. Um, so using this kind of benchmark, uh, but in a multilingual setting, uh, here we uh, show the average scores for uh, code lama, lama two, and some external models. So code lama is in uh, pink on top there. Uh, lama two is in green. And the first thing that you can see is that as you increase the size of these models, so as you go more uh, towards the right on this plot, uh, you also tend to increase the performance. Uh, so you also go higher. Another thing is that uh, even the 70 uh, billion parameters version of uh, LAMA2 um, is below uh, the 7B version of code LAMA despite having uh, 10 times the number of parameters, meaning that code LAMA is much more efficient uh, for code benchmarks. And uh, if you compare our 7B model with uh, Codex V1 or Star Coder, uh, which are significantly larger, you can see that the performance is about the same. Um, and uh, when it comes to the 13 billion and 34 billion versions of Code Lama, well, they uh, clearly outperform all the other open models that, um, that were out there at least at that time. So, now, if you want to look at Python code generation, um, so here there are a bit more values on uh, this chart. And um, also the model size is now in um, log scale because there are some pretty large models out there. Uh, GPT-4 is rumored to have at least a trillion parameters in total. Um, not sure exactly how much it is, but uh, that's where it is on this chart. Um, and here you can see, you can still see that for Python, you have a pretty big gap between uh, Lama 2, uh, which are the orange uh, dots over there, and Code Lama, which are the uh, green dots. And um, there is still a gap between Code Lama and Code Lama Python, which was further fine tuned just for Python. And uh, that's uh, despite uh, Code Lama having seen all the Python data. 
uh, that, that we fine-tune on for code lamel Python uh, more than once. Um, then I also want to talk about some kind of uh, special features that we added in uh, code Lama on top of uh, Lama 2. So one of them is uh, long context fine tuning. Uh, the reason why we really wanted to support long context for code is because uh, most of uh, your code lives inside of a, a pretty large code base. And uh, for a lot of use cases on code, you actually want to be able to use some of this information that you get in your code base in order to generate what really works for you. And um, so with the uh, context size that uh, models like Lama2 support, uh, basically you are limited to about 300 to 400 lines of code, uh, meaning that uh, already if your file is quite large, you need to remove some of the information for instance, the imports or some functions that you define in your file. Uh, but with Code Lama, uh, we increase it to up to 100,000 tokens. And it means that you can, um, well, you, you can put the context of uh, most files uh, in uh, in the model. And you can, you can also add a bunch of context, for instance, uh, all the other files that are open in your, um, in your IDE or uh, you can do retrieval to find um, what is most relevant in your code base, or uh, add the files that are in the same folder, or even add some documentation about the language that you are using. And uh, here I give a bit of uh, details on uh, how we do that. Um, so the main idea is that uh, training on long context is quite expensive uh, because the um, the attention as a quadratic complexity. So uh, what we do is that we just fine tune on long context at the end of training. And we see that we get most of the benefits for the, from doing that at a very small fraction of the code because we only fine tune on very few tokens. So for more details, we fine tune with a context size of uh, 16,000 tokens only on about 10 billion tokens. And um, we noticed that for it to work, you need to increase the uh, base frequency of the uh, rope um, position on beddings. And here we increase it from uh, 10,000 to 1 million. Uh, basically, if you don't do that, it completely fails. And if you do, it actually um, also works quite well on a longer context than those that you trained on. So here are some metrics on that. Um, this one is for retrieval accuracy. So uh, what this task is about is basically um, you defined a um, function somewhere in your file uh, that will just return a random uh, integer. And uh, then you have an assert at the end of your file, uh, which asserts that f uh, equal to and you ask for, you ask the model to complete. And uh, if the model is able to retrieve the value, it should be able to complete with the value that your uh, function uh, returning a random integer returns. And uh, here you can see uh, the 7B, 13B, and 34B versions of Code Lama and uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo. And um, what you can see there is that except for uh, the 7B model, uh, when the uh, function is defined at the very beginning of the file. Uh, here, we are pretty close to being able to retrieve uh, this token all, all the time. Um, so for this metric, at least, uh, I mean, it definitely shows that our model is able to uh, use context of up to 16,000 tokens. And uh, it does it quite well. Um, up to there. And then up to 100,000 tokens, uh, we also see a decrease in perplexity uh, when we add more context, uh, which shows that our model is able to make use of that. Um, 
to give you an idea, 100,000 tokens with our tokenizer corresponds to about 8,000 lines of code. And it's a 25x increase uh, compared to uh, Lama 2 and compared to quite a lot of models out there. Uh, then another feature, which is very important for code is infilling. The reason why it's important is that uh, no one writes code uh, completely linearly, starting from the top of the file and uh, going through the file until it reaches the bottom of the file. Uh, so in practice, you always want to uh, generate some functions in uh, the middle of your file or um, even in your function to come back some, to something above to uh, fill something. And infilling is what um, allows CodeLama to do that. So here, for instance, uh, you can see if you have this uh, main there, uh, which defines a character called Alice, even though the character class is not defined anywhere. So if you go above and just type class, uh, the model will be able to complete um, with a definition of a character class uh, that fits the uh, usage that, that is below. So it can use both the context coming before and after the cursor. For more details on how we train on theme, uh, we do it at character level on 90% of the batches. And uh, we use both the prefix suffix middle and suffix prefix middle format. And so, meaning that you can uh, use both of them at uh, test time. And um, our model performs quite well uh, for theme compared to other open models. And we see that uh, the suffix prefix middle format uh, tends to outperform the prefix suffix middle format. Um, so it's something where um, in the example that I've shown uh, before, for instance, the suffix will be uh, the main with the definition of the, with the uh, usage of the character class and the prefix will be uh, just the class token. Um, and I think that the reason is that if you, uh, if you put it this way, uh, it's much more natural to uh, complete for from prefix to middle for the model uh, because it's a sequence that uh, the model actually sees at pre-training time. I mean, in natural sequences. Um, then um, we actually see a small cost of uh, training on theme on standard benchmarks. Um, so here on, uh, in this table, the absolute gap uh, shows how much we lose by adding theme. Um, and it's basically often around uh, one to, uh, to two percent on uh, benchmarks like human eval and MPPP. Uh, but we still think that it's it's worth it basically because it allows us to support quite a lot of use cases for programming. Okay, so all this was maybe a bit abstract. And here I have an example of uh, what you can do with CodeLama Instruct 34B. So it's the Instruct version of our model and also the most powerful uh, largest version. And um, so here we're going to ask it to write a simple version of Pong using Pygame. And it's not an easy task because uh, you first need to understand the assignment in order to do that. Uh, then you need to make some design choices such as choosing which keyboard are going to be used to move the paddles. And then you need to generate correct code uh, by calling the right uh, functions from the right uh, libraries. And uh, let's see what the model does. So it says, sure, starts uh, generating some code. And uh, once it's generated, you can already start uh, playing the game, basically, uh, if, you, if you just take this code and execute it. And the nice thing there is that, well, uh, you can actually copy paste this code and uh, modify it to fit your exact preferences and to do exactly what you want. And um, 
Actually, you can even ask uh, Codelama to modify it for you uh, in chat mode. Okay, and I want to finish um, my talking about uh, what has been done based on Codelama uh, by the community. So, uh, for instance, Wizard Coder and Find uh, managed to increase their performance on human eval by more than 20% by switching from another model to ours. Uh, in the first week, we got quite a lot of stars on GitHub and downloads on Hugging Face. And I also really want to talk about uh, these amazing tools that were created by the community since we uh, released Codelama. Uh, so there is a plugin uh, that was created by Hugging Face that allows you to uh, use code Lama in VS Code. There is another one that was created by Continue. And also there is this tool called uh, Olama, which allows you to download some quantized or non-quantized versions of the model and to run them in your terminal uh, completely locally. And if in case you're bundling, it runs very well on uh, M1 uh, MacBooks, for instance. Okay, that's all for me. And uh, feel free to ask any questions. All right, thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. So yeah, uh, uh, for the audience, please ask your questions using the Q&A tool. And Alex, uh, I'll leave the discussion to you. So if you also have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. Yeah, I don't see any questions right now yet. So I'll get started with a, you know one high level question uh, with Kolama, which is, you know what do you think were some of your biggest learnings throughout the process as you were developing Kolama? You know, like what, what parts do you find were challenging? Uh, what were the parts where you had to iterate multiple times to get right? You know, like what do you think were some of the main learnings that you had throughout this entire process of developing this uh, model? Um, yeah, I think something that is quite different from, um, from most of the machine learning projects is that uh, when you're when you're working on pretty long trainings using quite a lot of GPUs, uh, you need to be quite sure that what you're running is uh, is going to work before you run it. Um, I mean, when your training takes more than uh, when your training takes several weeks, uh, yeah, basically if it fails, you you can waste a lot of time. Um, so so here we. Um, needed to to be especially careful about all the ablations that we are doing on uh, smaller models uh, before scaling up to to larger models, in order to make sure that uh, well uh, we're running the uh, best versions of what we had for uh, the largest models that we trained, especially. Could you talk maybe a little more about that? You know, like what were the scales of the smaller models you were training? What were the parameters you were tuning? Like, did you tune the architecture at all, or was it mostly learning rate, batch size, those types of hyperparameters? You know, what were the variables involved there? Yeah, I think the learning rate and batch size are they are definitely important parameters. Um. So sometimes it can be a bit tricky to. Um, to to find the best uh, batch size because you, because you're not always sure that it will uh, generalize to larger models. Uh, you know, for instance, some batch sizes may be stable for smaller models but not for larger ones. Um, but yeah, for more details, we uh, basically did most of the ablations on uh, models with seven billion parameters or one point five billion parameters, mostly seven billion actually for Codelama. And um, um, yeah, there, there were quite a lot of uh, parameters, for instance, the data set mix, uh, the learning rate, as you said. Um, I mean, um, there are quite a lot of things to try on the uh, data set in general as well. Mm -hmm. So Mike uh, Barclay has a question, which is, if you removed all the documents that contain the word Pong from the training set, and then you try to describe the game in English, uh, what do you think will happen? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I 
So, uh, I think the model will still probably be able to uh, to generalize. Like if you if you try to ask it to um, to generate uh, two rectangles on each side of the screen, um, and then to uh, move the rectangles using uh, some keys on your keyboard and things like that, it will be able to do it. But I think that you you will basically need to to give a lot more uh, details. I think that um, yeah, here one of the reasons why this example works really well is that it's a classical game. Um, so you have a lot of data, but people talking about pong and I mean. There are definitely also some uh, implementations online. Um, and the model is able to generalize since it can you know, create one using uh, maybe a library that's different from what it had seen. Um, you could ask it to use uh, different keys for your controls or different colors, for instance. Um, but yeah, I think. If you if you removed everything talking about Pong uh, in the training data set, uh, you will definitely need to be much more detailed uh, to prompt the model to generate something like that. Cool. Yeah, another question that's asked is, you know, what what do you think it will take to fine tune Colama to other languages beyond Python? I like first, is it possible for the work to be done by the open source community? You know, is there enough of the tools and base layers that are openly available? But also another aspect of that is, you know, do you think the data aspect, you know, like there's a lot of Python code online and let's say you want to fine tune Colama to do a more low resource language. What do you think it will take to do that? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a very good question. Um, so I think that there are some tools available online and that the um, open source community could use to fine tune a model such as Codelama on on uh, well different things. Um, so I know that Vicuna, for instance, um, open source their uh, fine tuning code, and that's something that uh, that you could use. And in terms of in terms of data, um, well, I definitely think that you will see some overfitting um, at some point if you use if you want to fine tune on. Um, for a language that uh, doesn't have a lot of data online. Um, yeah, so if you wanted to fine tune your model for COBOL, for instance, I think it will mostly make sense if you, um, you know, if your company has a lot of COBOL data available. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise using only the data available online, I'm, I think it will it it may be too small to um to get much better results by fine tuning. And do you have any sense how much data is enough to get you know a relatively reasonable or usable usable result? Um. Yeah, I think it's um. It's quite difficult to to say. Probably depends on your use case as well. Um. I think if you have in the order of a million files, it's probably it's probably enough to uh, to get good results if you um, if you're careful during fine tuning. Um, but then, yeah, I I haven't done uh, that many experiments on that, so I wouldn't really be able to say. Makes sense. Matthew Tweet has a question, which is, what are the next areas of research that you think will further improve cogeneration models? Yeah, I really believe that um, you know, these models right now are basically treating code uh, like natural language, uh, while code can be uh, compiled and executed. So I really believe that uh, by uh, compiling, exec executing the code, and using the feedback that you can get from that, um, well, we'll be able to uh, really improve this model. Cool. 
another question is, did you guys do any research in terms of the efficiency of the code? For example, for longer contexts, uh, and then, you know, compared to say human standards or more specialized language models and so on. So you said for a longer context, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it for, uh, did we look at the efficiency of uh, generating code using our model uh, compared to like how fast it is compared to humans? Or do you mean uh, the efficiency in terms of, is it, is the code that is generated as optimal as code generated by humans? So I think the question is talking about, since they do mention for longer context, uh, my guess would be that the question is more um, targeted towards when the context is longer, you know, how does something like code llama compare to humans efficiency? Or maybe the efficiency of a language model that's specialized for like a specific task. Yes, yeah, so you mean in terms of accuracy? Um, yeah, so um, I, I think that, um, I think that these models are able to use longer context, uh, but to generate very long uh, sequences of code, I think they are missing this part um, where they can execute the code, see the output, and uh, self-correct. Um, because you know the um, like human programmers, I guess, um, when uh, generating code, these models make mistakes. And if you uh, generate very long sequences of code, the probability that they make a mistake increases exponentially. So, um, yeah, basically, when you generate very long sequences, uh, because uh, human developers will self-correct uh, using the execution and these models don't, uh, I think that the accuracy tends to uh, really go down. Uh, in terms of uh, speed, uh, because I'm not sure if it was the question or, or not. Uh, well, of course, these models are, are much faster. And uh, yeah, they can run, uh, they can generate several things in parallel. So another question related to long context is, you know, what do you think it will take for something like Code Llama to be more useful in terms of like longer software engineering benchmarks. Uh, for example, if you have, you know, very large code base with 10 files and each file is extremely long, you know, what do you think will be the way forward for these code language models in completing these types of tasks? Yeah. Um, so something that we didn't really look into um, for Code Lama is um, basically using uh, using retrieval to find uh, the right context in in a large code base. Um, because, you know, maybe 10 files will fit in uh, in your context. Uh, but I think that most of the large code bases will, will have a lot more files than that, and so it will be uh, difficult to make them fit. Um, so by using retrieval, you could basically uh, scale to uh, support use cases on entire code bases. And um, yeah, I think if you give the right context, uh, these models are already able to generate things that make sense. How do you, how good do you think the model is at, you know, in some types of like natural retrieval? Like if you include a bunch of relevant information, you know, let's say include like 20 files, but only one of the functions in the 20 files is relevant. You know, how good do you think the models are at actually picking out that is the, you know, that is the file versus needing to do say explicit retrieval? Yeah, so you know, we we don't really have a proper task to uh, to test that. Um, I think the closest thing that we had was this retrieval task where we have a pretty long context of uh, say 16,000 uh, tokens, and we try to put this function that returns an integer somewhere randomly in uh, uh, in this context. And we see that the model is able to uh, retrieve the uh, integer that this function returns uh, well almost all the time. Um, so, I mean, of course, it's quite specific, and it doesn't guarantee that it will be able to do it for um, you know, other things, especially uh, for use cases in which um, 
it's much more difficult to know, uh, for instance, which function you should use or uh, what is relevant and what isn't. Uh, but yeah, it gives me the impression that um, that our model is pretty good at doing that. Yeah, maybe now let's uh, shift over to a little bit more on the data side. Could you maybe talk about some of the things that you did with the data? You know, like what data needed to go into your model to make sure that everything was, you know, like were there any tricks you needed to play, any filtering uh, of the data? How did you pick maybe like, you know, what was the mix of natural language to code? Like how did you come up with that mix? You know, like, and anything else about the data yeah. that might be interesting to everybody? Yeah, so about the data, um, so we had mostly code, but we found that by keeping some natural language, you get better performance, especially on MPPP, but even on uh, human level as well. Um, so uh, that's why we decided uh, to have to keep to keep some natural language uh, in the functioning. Um, and well, in terms of cleaning. Um, I think it's definitely important to uh, to clean the data that you that you use to train this kind of this, this kinds of uh, models. And um, well, the main thing to do to to clean data is to uh, to look at it and um, try to find some rules to uh, remove the elements that um, that don't really make sense and that you uh, wouldn't want your LLM to generate. And then in terms of you know, making sure your models don't generate, say, malicious content or code with security bugs or anything like that, did you do anything special to ensure something like that? Yeah, so um, for that, we have mostly done things for the instruct model. Uh, so basically there, we uh, we also made sure to have some, uh, some safety um, some safety prompts uh, that we trained on, uh, so that when you ask the model to generate malicious code, for instance, it uh, refuses to do it. And what? How were the prompts generated? I guess it would be pretty interesting to hear that. Yeah. So, uh, the prompts for instruction functioning were generated with human annotators. Mm -hmm. How much, how many prompts do you think would be necessary for that, right? It's like, let's say I'm a, say a proprietary company or something, and then, or maybe I want to develop some open source model, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want people to use it maliciously, right? You know, what, yeah. what would be required for me to take, say, a general purpose code model trained on everything and then get it to kind of be aligned in some sense with the user's desires? Yeah. Um, my impression is that you, uh, you can get something that's uh, pretty helpful with only a small amount of uh, functioning data. Uh, like even if you have just a few thousands or 10,000 uh, examples that uh, show the model how to be helpful and how to answer questions, I think it's um, you're already going to get something um, that, that works quite well if you function on that. Uh, for safety, um, I think it's much more difficult because you, um, well, it's kind of an adversarial game where uh, people can think of tons of ways to uh, go around the safety things that you bait into the model. Uh, so I think that in that case, you uh, you need to have a lot of examples uh, to, to make it pretty safe for most of the use cases. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the role of natural language when you're training these code mo code models, right? Like, uh, because for example, you know, what what do you think will happen if you trained a model that's like one hundred percent on the code? You know, like what capabilities do you think would lose, or what if you increase the amount of natural language? Let's say you train on like eighty percent natural language and twenty percent code, right? Do you think it will suddenly gain some more better like natural language to code abilities, or what's the what do you perceive as the yeah. role there? Um. So, yeah, I think the, the role of natural language is, you no know, MPPP is a natural language to, to code task. 
Um, so I think that training on some natural language may be important for uh, to, to be good on this, to understand the uh, natural language that you give as input. Um, but then if you, it's not like it fails uh, completely if you train only on code. It's actually something that we tried. Uh, the performance was lower, but not that much lower. It was still uh, performing reasonably well. And I think it's because you actually have quite a lot of natural language in code, uh, for instance, in comments or in uh, doc strings. And so it's still able to, it still works quite well for, uh, for coding tasks, even if you train 100% uh, on code. Um, we didn't actually test um, on uh, natural language benchmarks for uh, the model trained completely on code. My guess would be that it loses more than uh, code lama on these benchmarks. Um, but that's something that we uh, didn't really verify. And then for a model trained uh, mostly on natural language and with something like 10% of code, well, I think that there are a lot of models trained this way. And um, well, it's definitely a trade-off, at least for uh, the scale in terms of number of tokens that you train on uh, that we are working with definitely seems like uh, you can get better performance on code by adding code, uh, but you do get a bit worse on uh, natural language benchmarks. Do you think it's possible to you know get the best of both worlds? And if so, do you have any speculation on what might be the path forward doing that? Um, yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Um, I think it's one of the questions for which um, it could be that it works well just if you scale. Uh, like maybe if you have a larger model and train for uh, longer and more tokens, uh, you just get something that works well on um, on everything. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, uh, it's something that's, uh, difficult and expensive to to test, so yeah. uh, I don't really have the answer for that. And um, then I know that um, well, quite a lot of people work on ensembling type of uh, methods, uh, where for instance you will train a model that's specialized for code, another one that's specialized for natural language, and then I think that you can find ways to uh, merge them together. So about the impact of model scaling, I think one thing that's interesting is, you know, how do you, you talked about your, you have all these various models, let's say you've, you know, like all the way from 1.5B to like 34B and maybe even bigger, right? How do you think, what's the role of scaling? You know, how do you see, do you see these say emergent abilities occur as the models get bigger or, you know, maybe outside of some of these, just like human eval or MVPP type benchmarks, what do you think is, what does scale give you in terms of code models? Yeah, um, so to answer the, the first question, it seems like at least at our scale, and if you start from Lama 2, um, like, you know, if you look at these curves over there, um, oh yeah, by the way, I added a 70 uh, billion parameters version for Code Lama and uh, Code Lama Python there uh, that we train internally. Um, so you can see that the performance for code lama and uh, code lama python seems to still be increasing kind of uh, linearly uh, which shows that i mean at least up to that scale um well it still uh, brings quite a lot of benefits to uh, fine tune your model to a particular use case um even though for code lama we have already seen the uh, python data more than once and uh, so, I mean, uh, my guess is that uh, it will plateau at some point. Um, but here for um, this number of tokens and um, this model size, it seems like it uh, hasn't plateaued yet. Uh, I, I have a, a quick, quick question. 
So you mentioned earlier that uh, obviously the way that a developer uh, corrects his code is by executing the code and basically finding bugs and, and debugging it. Um, do you think uh, Code Yama would be able to debug its own code? Like I've tried in the let's say in the conversational setting to feedback the output of the code to see if it's able to fix the issues, or maybe the context becomes too long and it starts uh, hallucinating. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely some cases in which it was able to correct its own output. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if you generate long functions and you need to regenerate the entire function every time, uh, then the context becomes very long, uh, very quickly. Um, but with short functions, at least it works. And I think that we you know we could do smarter things such as only generating the diff in order to be able to correct mm -hmm. uh, without increasing yep. the context size too much. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. One maybe more high level question is how do you see you know programming changing as a result of these tools, right? Because right now the way people are using these tools like Copilot is you know they use them as you're writing code, it automatically completes things. But perhaps you're kind of hinting at there being more different capabilities, right? Like let's say repairing code, or maybe even people can write a natural language and then it's gonna get a code as an output, right? And so one thing that a lot of people have been talking about is you know what will be the future interface for how humans and uh, you know code interact. And I'm very curious to hear what are your personal thoughts on uh, that? Um, yeah, 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 that's a good point. I think that, I mean, definitely right now, most of the uh, applications that we see seem to be uh, for generating very short um, pieces of code, to so say like in Copilot, for instance. And I think that as these models become uh, more, more powerful and as we build more tools around these models to uh, so that we can trust their outputs more, uh, we'll be able to generate bigger and bigger chunks of code and uh, maybe even some uh, you know pretty complex programs um, out of the box just by querying uh, in natural language. I also think that um, we could see these tools being used more for uh, automatic um, project migration for instance to go from uh, one version of a language to another one or from a programming language to another one or to optimize code automatically, for instance. Cool. Yeah, Martin has a question. Maybe you could ask. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, hi, Batsy. It's great, great talk. Um, I saw the, in the paper that you have this uh, model called the unnatural code llama that seems to have like amazing performance, um, but it's not released. I wondered if you could give us a bit more details about that model. Um, yeah, so for these models, all the details that I can give are in the paper. Um, so basically, we uh, use the same method as the um, as the unnatural model that we uh, as the unnatural um, training paper that we cited in uh, in the Codelama paper. And um, yeah, we also we also do it with um generations that we filter using unit tests it's also something that we talk about in uh, self-training and so um, yeah we do something close to that thank you i, I haven't actually seen the, the paper that you referred to are you able to give a brief summary um yeah so uh, basically it's about generating some uh, outputs to some prompt with a uh, with a model and then uh, training on the output. Okay, thank you. So maybe oh. maybe one one other question about you know using Colama to do other capabilities, right? How, uh, let's say you want to find fine tune Colama to say do program repair or fine tune Colama to do. Uh, say other other tasks like code understanding, maybe code summarization, debugging, all of that. 
Uh, what do you think is like? Do you have any say recommended recipe for somebody who wants to take your base core llama and get it to do other abilities? Um. Yeah, I think the first thing to try is um. Is to use the instruct version and to ask it to do what you want. Um. But then you can also use the you can also use the base version, and try in a few shots, with a few examples of um your use case, uh, mostly short examples if you don't want to increase the uh, your sequence size too much. Um, and um, I think it's generally already a very strong uh, baseline. Uh, but then if you have some data or if you think that you can create some data uh, for your use case, uh, I think it's also worth uh, fine tuning on it to to see how much of an improvement you can get. Yeah, there's also actually a lot of talk about, you know, like, do you really need all this data to train, like, Code Llama, right? Do you really need the entirety of the stack and a bunch more natural language data to train something like Code Llama? Do you have any thoughts on, for example, would it be possible to get up to Code Llama performance if you only used, say, 10% of the stack or maybe even 1% of the stack? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I... I haven't done this uh, this ablation. I think definitely it will be possible to get uh, to the same performance on uh, benchmarks such as human evil uh, by using a lot less data. Um, because if you um, have some data that's really in domain, um, or if you select or create some data that's in domain, uh, like a very short, um, self-contained um, coding questions, for instance. Uh, well, I think if you train on this kind of stuff, um, you can get, you, you can increase your performance on benchmarks uh, very quickly. But I think that, um, well, I think that basically these benchmarks are only useful if you, if you don't do that. Uh, because if you don't, it uh, gives you an idea of the, uh, general coding capabilities of your model. Um, well, if you uh, create some data and train a model, especially to um, improve performance on these benchmarks, um, it will tend to overfit them a bit. And um, like I think that uh, your performance won't be as representative of uh, the results that you will get from arbitrary uh, coding task. Cool, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, unfortunately we're running out of time, but yeah, thanks a lot again for the very interesting talk and, uh, and the great discussion to Baptiste and Alex. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here at the meetup. Uh, and just a reminder that the talk screen is, has been recorded and it's going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So please follow us on YouTube and don't forget to sign up for the next meetup uh, on the meetup website. All right. Thanks again to Alex and Baptiste and see you at the next meetup. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. See you.